Hey everybody, it's Drew's Doctor back again for the second video in the series about ship fitting for new bros. In this video, we're going to talk about tech and meta and what they mean. This is strictly the broad strokes. So tech, faction, and meta are terms which indicate the quality, rarity, or power of an item or ship hull. The terms tech and meta, eh, they're more or less interchangeable. Um, every ship has a tech rating and a meta rating. Uh, typically, they are iterative in a way that lower is not as good and higher is better, or strictly more rarefied in the sense that it may be a more powerful unit. Um, that said, modules with a shared tech rating may have different meta ratings and vice versa. Faction modules are treated as colloquially being meta modules, and meta meaning not tier one or tier two, and they originate with pirate factions and the plans to construct them have to be purchased with loyalty points. An example faction ship would be the Astero frigate from the Sisters of Eve. Now, meta versus tech in vessels. Let's talk about the basic offerings from the Keldark. So the Griffin is an ECM frigate, is an electronic countermeasures or E-war frigate. It has the Griffin Navy issue as its faction alternative or its faction version. And where the Griffin differs from the Griffin Navy is that the Griffin Navy is designed for up close and personal fighting. It is designed to operate in a very short distance. It has a PvP focus and can be flown by Alpha clones. The con is that it's three to tie five times as expensive as a base griffin. The Kitsune, which is the tier two version of the griffin, is superior in practically every way. It has superior bonuses, but it's also ten times as expensive as the griffin. And if you're not an Omega clone, you can't train to fly it and you don't have the ability to sit in it. So if you're not a subscriber, you don't gain access to this, the ability to train the skill, even if you've bought the skill book, to be able to get into it and fly it. And it will not let you in the ship if you're not an Omega subscriber, meaning that you're paid to subscribe to the game. That's where the, the skill wall comes in between Alpha and Omega clones. Alpha clones are free to play, but you don't get to play with the really nice toys. Sorry, not sorry. Tier 1 is the starting point. Baseline stats and per-level bonuses based on trade skills. Faction or meta are the next step up in equipment and typically in ships too. They have better stats than the baseline. They often take less CPU than Tier 1. They're a good milieu between Tier 1 and Tier 2 modules, and they're often way more expensive than Tier 2, depending on rarity and source. And I'm going to give you a really good example of that here in a second. Tier 2 are typically for stats the best of the best, they offer peak performance to cost for most modules, but they typically take a lot more room to fit in terms of power grid and CPU. So let's look at the example of the basic tier one warp disruptor. It has an activation cost of 25 gigajoules. Its cycle is five seconds. Its running cost from your capacitor is five gigajoules per second. So, you know, if it cycles for five seconds, it's 25 gigajoules to keep it running. And the range is 20 kilometers. It uses one power or one megawatt of power grid and 40 teraflops of GPU. Now let's look at the storyline module, the interruptive warp disruptor. The difference between the interruptive and the standard warp disruptor is that the interruptive is far less activation cost for power. It's a lower running cost for um, for power. It has the same cycle time, five seconds. It reaches farther, it has a 24 kilometer reach, and it's half as much CPU to fit. The Kaldari Navy Warp Disruptor, probably one of the most favored modules in the game for PvP, especially for tackle. Uh, 20 gigajoule cost, so higher than the interruptive, but lower than the tier one. Again, cycles for five seconds, needs one megawatt of power to run has a running cost of four gigajoules per second for power, which is less than the tier one, but more than the interruptive, but has a 26 kilometer reach. And the CPU is just, just a hair's more than what you'd pay for the interruptive, um, but 
still almost half what the tier one uses. So when it comes to fitting modules, if you're trying to fit space in, uh, metal modules work really well for that. Now, when we look at the tier two warp disruptor, same 24 kilometer range as the interruptive, not quite as good as Kaldari Navy module. It's five millisecond, or sorry, five second um, uh, cycle time, one megawatt power grid, but it has more CPU use and more activation cost than the tier one module. So you kind of go the other direction when you get to tier two. They become more expensive to fit than tier one modules, but the expectation is that by the time you're using them, your pilot has trained enough of the core fitting skills that that cost difference is mitigated in the fact that your skills will compensate for that extra power draw. You're able to use your systems better. So it basically washes out. The running cost is six gigajoules per second, which is again, slightly higher than the cost for tier one. But again, if you've trained your core fitting skills and your core skills for ship operation, uh, that won't matter because those skills reduce the cost for fitting and running these modules. So here's the basic stack up. Tier one, baseline, tier two, much better stats, but you have to have the skills to fit them. And then the storyline, typically great stats, low cost to fit, and the faction modules, um, you know, really easy to fit, great, great stats. Now, where, where's the benefit in going to tier two if storyline and faction are so freaking amazing? Well, let's look at the cost. Tier one warp disruptor is 24,000 ISK. Anybody can afford one. The cost of an interruptive warp disruptor last I checked in GETA was 43 million is. That's more than most of the ship hulls you'll fly at a new player level. The Kaldari Navy warp disruptor is a damn near staggering 77 million is. And if you're a new bro trying to farm up enough is to buy your first destroyer, 77 million is is going to look like a lot of money. It's not really, not when you've been playing the game for a while and you will get to the point that, you know, Losing a couple million-esque ship, you'll just honestly laugh and hop into the next one in your hangar. Um, trust me, it does get better. Stick with it. Watch these videos. Talk to people. Learn from your preparation. Attend classes. Any, there's lots of them if you can. Um, you will get there. But yeah, the advantage to storyline and faction modules is that, yeah, they're freaking amazing. They're also much more rare. And ergo, supply and demand, much more expensive. Whereas the tier two module is only a million and a third, you know, 1.384 million is. So really, you know, jumping from tier one to tier two, not so hard to pill a swallow. Just spend the extra time training your character and it will, you'll be fine. So the question is why use a meta module if they're so freaking expensive? Well, let's look at that. There are several reasons. The first is you want specific bonuses. You have a ship that benefits from those bonuses. Why not throw the absolute best module on the ship that you can afford in order to maximize the benefit of that? A good example of that is flying a Garmer and having a Kaldari Navy warp disruptor on it because the, the Garmer gets bonuses to warp disruption. A uh, specific playstyle might be that if you're somebody who enjoys Kaidi Frigates, I've seen my previous reference to the Garner, <laughs> if you're a fan of Kaidi Frigates, you want a Warp Disruptor with greater reach, because you want to stay outside of the damage range of the frigate you're shooting at. Then there's specific fits. A lot of it has to do with fitting room. If your ship is filled up with T2 modules and you only have so much room left for that support module you really wanted, the only way you might be able to fit it in there is if you grab a meta module. You know, you swallow the bill and you buy something a little bit expensive because it just happens to fit how much room you have left. And then, of course, to show off. If you're somebody who, you know, money doesn't matter and hashtag already replaced, then go ahead, show off. Buy a blingy ship. Fit all the expensive modules to it you can. Now, there are, I will point out, two other classifications of module above this, which are DED and officer modules, but I'm going to cover those in an advanced video. Um, and those are functionally for new players uh, so hideously, hilariously expensive that don't even bother um, unless you're out there farming them. Now, how module size affects fitting. Let's look at the example of real dig guns. You know, going back to the Minmatar example from the previous video. 
any standard soldier can pick up a, a long barreled rifle and fire it and expect that it's going to work in a specific way. Whereas when you get into bigger bullets and longer barrels, you typically need to have something you mount to a vehicle. So a you know, 50 cal belt fed machine gun sitting on the back of a Jeep, that's something that's reasonable for shooting at you know, man-sized targets or even small vehicles at a longer distance. When you need to hit a bigger target or hit a hardened target, you need to go to a bigger gun. Or if you're shooting farther away or there's more of the enemy to shoot, maybe you want something that shoots faster and farther away. But then you get to a point where maybe the enemy is really far away and maybe they're in the air above you, so you might need something like this German ground-mounted anti-aircraft weapon. Still much larger than the belt fed 50 cal, but, uh, you know, it's likely firing 20 millimeter bullets, but you're going to be in a situation where, you know, that is the weapon that is called for. And the bigger the guns get, the bigger the emplacements they need. Eventually, you want to shoot really far away and hit really big targets. You're going to need something like, you know, a portable uh, drop-in-place howitzer. Or maybe you need a tank. Maybe you need a specific platform that's designed to be mobile and fire large bullets. Uh, in this case, the individual rounds can weigh as much as, you know, a full-grown German Shepherd or more. You're essentially firing 75-pound to 150-pound units straight down range. Now, these in these situations, uh, depending on, you know, what they're composed of and the type of weapon that you're engaged in, these same principles apply to ships at Eve right up to battleship size and even capital ship size weapons. And this goes not just for weapons, but also for other systems. The armor plating that you're going to fit on the side of a Jeep to try to harden the engine so people can't shoot it out while you're trying to get someplace and strand you is going to be a whole lot different than the armor plating on a Canadian C2 Leopard. You're also going to run into a far, far bigger categorization of armor when you're going to a battleship, because you're able to hang several ton steel plates on the side of the ship. Like, you're building the stuff into how you structure it based on the battle that you need to engage in. And this applies for the ships in Eve. Because you're not going to want to take a standard infantry rifle and fit it on a battleship. It's woefully undersized. And yeah, I mean, it might help if you've got, you know... Uh, African East Coast Raiders coming up to try to board your ship, but it's really not going to help you if you're fighting another battleship. It's just too underpowered. So yes, you can fit um, bigger or smaller modules on a ship, but there's a rationale towards doing it. So let's talk about the different module sizes. Micro are modules that are used on frigate, and, only, and even then only if you can't really fit small modules. They also tend to be really, really, really expensive. Small modules are the standard module used on frigates and destroyers. A micro module is designed to be able to just kind of fit in there as an extra piece. Uh, imagine it like having a Jeep that's already got a mounted machine gun and you decide to put on a small side mounted rocket launcher on the side of it. Or you put on some other small system that amplifies the capacity of that ship, but it's going to be pretty expensive. Medium modules are used on cruisers and battle cruisers. You cannot fit medium weapons to a small vessel, by the way. Same goes for larger categories. Large is used on battleships or capital ships. And XL or capital weapons are used on capital ships. Same goes for the modules. Now, you'll notice that in the large category, large modules are used on battleships or capital ships. Where, where I want to clarify here is that where it says or capital ships, there are some categories of modules that do not have a capital-sized version. So battle, uh, ships larger than a battleship are forced into using battleship-sized modules for those categories. That's where this distinction comes in, why there's an or there. So, let, you know, let's talk about why you might fit something in there. Putting a medium-sized afterburner in a frigate is something that happens a lot when you need to be able to burn in a straight line and go really fast. And, you know, it's like putting a really big engine in a really small car. The problem with that is that putting that really big engine in a really small car 
you're kind of overpowering it and maybe you're turning, which might have been great on the small car by itself, and it goes out the window because you don't necessarily want to be trying to pull a tight corner when you're going three times as fast as the ship is designed to go. Whereas if you take a ship that's designed to go really, really fast and you put a really, really big engine in it, it'll do that really, really well. Another example, going back to the Garner. Um, you know, and it's it, it, the comparable difference in price is, yeah, grab a T1 frigate and put a medium afterburner on it. Sure, you're not going to have a lot of room for fitting other things, but it'll make you go real fast. And that might be useful in certain scenarios. There are certain fits where that becomes advantageous. But getting a really expensive ship that benefits from having those bigger modules and maybe has a little bit of extra fitting room to make that work um, can work in your advantage. But it's going to be really expensive, going back to the whole idea of meta modules. And using here the example of the, the Bugatti Veyron, which has a price of two million U.S. dollars, but can go 408 kilometers per hour. That's 250 miles per hour in the Americas. Um, so I really hope that this has helped kind of clarify some of the things around meta and faction and size. Um, you know, every ship in the game has a has an appropriate um, meta and faction that goes with it based on the fit that you're that you're going for and the function that the ship is serving. And again, this goes back to what we talked about in the first video where, you know, choose the ship that suits what you're trying to do. You know, choose the ship that fits where you're trying to go and what you're trying to do and who you're doing it with. And you will be more successful. If you like this video, please feel free to throw me a thumbs up. If you have any questions, you know, do the doobity doo and put them in the comments section below. I will gladly answer any questions you throw my way. And thank you so much again for joining me. Talk to you again soon.